Good evening, and welcome to a community conversation on reimagining public safety, confronting the problem of policing. I'm Ann Manning, and I co-chair the Racial Justice Initiative at Plymouth Congregational Church here in Minneapolis, where we are coming to you live from the sanctuary. We're pleased tonight to be co-presenting this event with United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. Our supporting sponsors are the Minnesota Council of Churches and the Hennepin History Museum. We are so appreciative of all of the work our staff at United, Plymouth, and our sponsors did to get us ready for this, to get the word out, and to handle all the logistics. We could not do this without you. It's no secret to anyone that Minnesota is ground zero for looking at issues surrounding policing in our country today. Tonight, we will look more deeply at how we got here and how we might move forward. In the fall, we will present another uh, part of this series, looking at some promising new police reforms. We'll also be hosting a session specifically to the proposed charter amendments uh, for the city of Minneapolis this fall. So please join us for those two additional series. Our panelists tonight are some of the very best people I know to be talking about these issues. So this will be a very deep and rich conversation. And we thank you all for being here. A link to tonight's event will be put on both the United and Plymouth websites in the coming days. So feel free to watch it again and be sure to pass it on to friends and family. A few notes about how the evening will unfold. Our first hour will be a conversation between the moderator, Reverend Dr. Gary Green, and the panelists who Gary will introduce shortly. About eight o'clock, we'll shift to the Q&A format. Seth Patterson, Plymouth Minister of Spiritual Formation and Theater will be handling the Q&A. You will hear him, but you won't see him. Please type questions and any comments you actually want the moderator uh, of the um, computer to see in the Q&A function. The chat is only for technical issues or general comments. So if you have a question or a comment that you want Seth to see, um, please put it in the Q&A function. And we know there'll be a lot of questions. Seth will do his best to combine similarly themed questions. Our moderator for tonight's event is Reverend Dr. Gary F. Green II, Assistant Professor of Pastoral Theology and Social Transformation at United Seminary. He earned his PhD from Bright Divinity School, where he focused on issues related to young African-American men through the lens of public pastoral theology. His dissertation entitled, Playing the Game, Unmarking Beast from the Bodies of Young Black Men, is a project that seeks to humanize young black men by allowing their voices to challenge stereotypical scripts that cast them as beasts for public consumption. Gary, we at Plymouth are really excited about a book launch here in the sanctuary when your dissertation is published. And you can read more about his distinguished career on United's website. I also want to mention that Gary and his colleagues at United have initiated a series called Disrupting White Supremacy. You can find the first one from this past March on YouTube. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Gary. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all for, for being here. And I am super excited about this conversation. Uh, as, as kind of the new guy in town, I'm super excited to be on this panel with you all and to, and to hear from your wisdom. Uh, my goal for tonight is to, is to ask questions that allow you to share that wisdom and to offer your perspectives as people who have been on the grounds, on the front lines, and have been in the middle of the work that needs to be done. So thank you, Anne, and thank you. Now, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, and I want to try as best as possible to be brief because I know that this is going to be a robust conversation that we're going to run out of time. 
Um, I could talk about each of you all day long in terms of the things that I've read, in terms of your accomplishments and your accolades. Um, and more importantly, I'm excited to get to know you as human beings who are doing the good work. <clears throat> so tonight we have with us, first of all, Reverend Nakima Levy Armstrong, JD. Nakima is a civil rights attorney and activist, a scholar, a former Minneapolis mayor candidate. You've seen Nakima on CNN, on PBS, on Democracy Now!, the list goes on and on and on, where you've been in spaces where you've been able to offer your voice publicly. But you've also seen Nakima at protests, yes. in the streets, and on the front lines of Minneapolis' fight for racial justice. Um, Nakima, welcome tonight. Thank you. We also have uh, to my left, Jaylani Hussein, who is currently the executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, uh, Minnesota chapter, and who previously has worked the as the community liaison officer at Metro State University and as a planner with background in urban planning, correct, uh, for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. The thrust of Jaylani's work focuses on advocating for the civil rights of Muslim communities, raising awareness and encouraging dialogue and building coalitions that promote justice and mutual understanding. And you've also seen Jaylani on the front lines yes. at protests in the streets in Minneapolis and Minnesota's struggle for racial justice. Jaylani, welcome. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Reverend Dr. Dwayne Davis, who is currently the lead pastor at this church, Plymouth Congregational Church, and who brings a wealth of experience that integrates faith, policy, and public advocacy. Duane has previously worked as a policy analyst in the Office of Governmental Relations for the Episcopal Church, as a lobbyist for Sally May, and, as a, and a decade as a senior legislative assistant for three members of the US Congress. So clearly a lot of political <laughs> praxis to pull from in this conversation. And yes, you guessed it. Dwayne has also been on the front lines, <laughs> mm -hmm. on the streets, at the protests, raising his voice in the midst of this latest, uh, just <laughs> the chaos of the last year and a half uh, and beyond that. Uh, Dwayne, welcome. Thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are. Yes. Uh, after a conviction uh, of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd, uh, experience of what I would say is a very cautious uh, optimism and a hope that this conviction is a symbol of things to come. And witnessing around the country and even at the federal level, uh, current efforts for police reform that tell a story that something could be potentially changing. And yet, we continue to witness the patterns of police violence uh, and, the and, the, and the authorized killing of black bodies that tells us there's also still clearly a problem. And I get the fact that we're not gonna solve this problem overnight. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's gonna be incremental, that it's collaborative and all of those things that are true. And yet it still points to the fact that there's much work to be done. Because the fact of the matter is there are far too many of us who still can't breathe mm -hmm. in this current reality. Despite all the optimism and despite all the movements, there are folks who still can't breathe. And at the same time, there are also too many among us who still can't see. Mm -hmm. right. And we shouldn't take this for granted. George Floyd for many, and I've heard people tell me this, was truly an eye-opening experience, which points to the fact that prior to what happened to George Floyd, there was an incapacity to see the ways that white supremacy and policing coexisted and really recreated each other. Tonight is about learning how to see it. Clearly because of the culture of white supremacy, will continue to produce death dealing <clears throat> realities for people of color, namely black people, if we do not learn to see it because we cannot disrupt something until we are able to recognize its rhythm in the first place. A quote from Jonathan Katz in an essay entitled The Invention of Heterosexuality said, and I quote, studying the history of a term and the term he was talking about was heterosexuality, but studying the history of the term challenges its power. This captures my hope for this evening, that a collaborative conversation among three powerful voices talking explicitly about white supremacy, its connections to policing and its consequences for our communities will lay it on the table so that we can begin to recognize its rhythm, to begin to disrupt it, and so that we can begin and continue to recreate new realities where all of us can thrive. This is where I wanna 
um, begin our conversation tonight. So as we think about together, uh, this first question will be for the panel. And as a way to kind of ground this initial, this opening question, built within the title of this conversation is the idea that policing is a problem, right? And while not everybody knows this intuitively based on personal experience or even agrees with this, um, there seems to be, especially since George Floyd's murder, an emerging awareness that there is in fact a bigger problem at play. That this is not something that just has to do with bad apples, um, but rather something more foundational and central to the existence of policing as an institution. So, but I don't wanna take for granted or assume that we all have a working understanding of what that means for policing to be a problem. So the first question that I want to pose to each of you, for each of you to respond to is what does it mean to you for policing to be a problem? How would you capture that for someone for whom it, this is be, just becoming a realization, right? So what is the significance of this, this claim that's built within the title of this? conversation. Okay, I will I'll start. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, well, one, thank you for hosting tonight's event and making this conversation possible. When I saw the title focused on policing being a problem, I was really happy that this church decided to not skirt around the issue, um, but to just be forthcoming about the fact that policing is a problem. I grew up in Los Angeles. I moved there in the mid 1980s. And there was a group um, called NWA. And they came out with the song called F the Police. Right. And they articulated as young black men, the problems that black people and particularly young black men in our community faced when encountering the police right. in terms of the harassment, um, in terms of the racial stereotyping in terms of people being um, arrested, brought into the system, and all the impacts that flowed from that. And what I recall as a young person living in that community during that period of time was that the powers that be, including well-to-do Black people, right. were more upset about the language that the group used to describe the negative interactions with police than the core aspects of their message, which signaled a major problem with an institution that far too many white people continue to have a lot of trust in. Um, I think that, you know, that protest song is stuck with me and it continues to inform my perception of what is going on with the institution of policing and, and my decision to not skirt around or away from the ugliness of what's happening within that system. I look back at the fact that the institution and system of policing goes hand in hand with the institution of slavery mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, the lingering effects and impacts of slavery and how uh, police started out as slave catchers. Right. Um, even the current issues we're talking about with the US Marshals um, and the recent killing of Winston Smith, looking at the history of the Marshals, they were tasked with the responsibility of catching fugitive slaves right. after the Fugitive Slave Act right. um, came into play in 1850. And that's an institution we're supposed to look up to and trust, right. but they captured black people in the North and brought them back to an institution that was filled with terrorism, barbarism, dehumanization of black people, and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, from a legislative perspective, if you look at the language of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall be allowed, except if one has been duly convicted of a crime, right. goes hand in hand with what's happening right now with policing. If Congress had truly intended to slavery completely, they never would have allowed for that caveat in the, caveat in the language of the 13th Amendment. They changed the laws on the books, they made standard behavior by Black men a crime, and they empowered white law enforcement officers to come into black communities, capture newly freed black men and bring them into the system and the state profited off of that labor. Right. Because corporations, mining companies, train companies, et cetera, all paid the state for this backbreaking labor of black people and particularly black men. And many of them died um, during their period of incarceration. And right. so we see the same thing happening today. Right, right, wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Nakima. 
which one of you all would like to follow that? <laughs> uh, thank you, Nikki, and thank you, uh, Dr. Green, for for uh, hosting this. Um, as someone who is a political scientist by training and uh, who worked in uh, doing public policy, the one reason I see policing as a problem because it is an institution that is almost immune to reform. Mm -hmm. Any institution that skirts oversight uh, that isn't reformed uh, inherently becomes problematic. Right. So that that's first and foremost. Right. When you look at throughout history, even when you get into the 20th century, when we talked about reforming police, the, the, the major reforms done to policing actually were professionalizing the police to get rid of corruption right. and unionizing police That's right. uh, to give them protection. But in terms of practice and policy, uh, it is largely gone unheeded, no reform. Even in 1968, when the Kerner Commission which it was about why did the summer riots of summer 1967, why did those riots happen? The Kerner Commission had an explicit part in its report about what was wrong with policing. Mm -hmm. Police were bad conduct, mm -hmm. no civilian oversight, uh, uh, and, and was not serving and protecting the population it was policing. Right. So, so already, already you have a major commission that's telling you right. what the problem is. Yes. We, Bad conduct. <laughs> you don't serve and protect the people you're policing. So, notice that's 1968. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, this is this is what I mean when I say they are immune right. to oversight and reform. We're not changing anything. And then, what is its product? Yeah. What does it deliver? Right. Uh, and and now this gets very tricky because one of the things that we do we we have in our minds. And by the way, Hollywood has helped in this regard the heroic police that's right mm. so that's that's the image that we have that's right but there's another thing if you look at policy what is the answer to social and economic crisis what is the answer to crime and the only product that get delivered is punitive policing mm -hmm. It's pure, and, and by the way, this, this indicts our lawmakers too, because when a, a community demands investments in human needs and economic uh, support or education, the policy choice that most often gets chosen is punitive police right. to control it. Right. And then finally, here's something that we, we haven't paid much attention to. The police have learned very well um, and, and we can go throughout history to see how it happens, but they have learned how to leverage racist backlash. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to convince a community or lawmakers to not reform you, to not exercise any oversight on you, then you have an ace in the hole. Mm -hmm. Crime, which over time has become synonymous with black, you deliver that. And you can always almost just about assure yourself that in the end, if we have any kind of debate about police, or even if we have any debate about investments in the community, at the end of the discussion, we are much more likely to end up with more police, yeah. more money for police, yeah. and less accountability. Yeah. I worked on several federal crime, crime bills, yeah. uh, and in the end, uh, the debate is over when there has been robust discussion about investments in communities with social economic crisis. We end up with more police, more money for police, and less accountability. Mm. That's Thank a problem. You. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. I should have went first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm glad I well, just had to moderate. <laughs> I, I, first of all, again, I want to thank Aniko. Um, what Wilkima and, and Dwayne said. Um, you know, for, for me, my experience um, as, a, as an immigrant coming here, and um, I was just reflecting, I was in the parking lot. I used to live about maybe nine blocks that way. Mm -hmm. So I used to ride my bike up and down on First Avenue. Um, I remember being Nicola Mall, riding a low rider bike, wearing sandals, not not dressed for the occasion. <laughs> and I remember a cop telling me, like, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And I knew what that meant, so I left. Um, I remember living in Columbia Heights and being pulled over all the time. Yep. 
for no reason. It was not tail lights. It wasn't nothing. Um, and I got used to it. And when I hear this question about is policing a problem, well, I also think that not only the folks that are not seeing the actual problem, but also the communities that are impacted by yes. the problem have internalized it. Yes. I just thought it was my car. Yeah. I didn't know that I was being black in a city yeah. and being pulled over. In fact, it got to the point where my parents forced me to sell the car. Yeah. They thought it was the car. Uh -huh. And I still was pulled over in a Pontiac Le Mans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they know that car is. But <laughs> like the, the car before that was the Toyota Supra. But... But coming back to the point, I think both Nakima and, and, and uh, Reverend Duane mentioned, and I wanted to expand one piece that you left at the end there, which is the issue with policing. And I've, I've, I've been, you know, I've talked to criminal justice professors, I've spoken to, you know, future law enforcement students. And the one thing that I think many people do not take into consideration, it is the one profession that is the least educated mm. that has the most power yeah the great deal of discretion that they have yes. at that stop and and a system that already we know the criminal justice system we already know if you don't have a higher power attorney right, right you the system doesn't work right um and so you have this individual least trained least educated right. who has the greatest power Yes. on communities that they don't even look like. Yeah, that's right. The yeah. other problem that many people don't realize is the two biggest deadliest encounters are traffic stops. Yes. And a human being who's dealing with mental illness. So, so, so think about that. Someone who's not well-trained, who has a great deal of power to make a decision at that moment. Um, and so when we think about problems of policing, we also have to take it back to the criminal justice system yes. and the, what is happening today where we, the nation that tells the rest of the world, America is the beacon of democracy, right. <clears throat> imprisons more people per capita than anyone else. That's right. And even if we prison people in places that look nice and rehabilitation was there, maybe that would be a something. Mm -hmm. But we actually treat our prisoners worse than third world countries. To the point where here in Minnesota, if you go to Norway and Sweden, some of these places many people from Minnesota are from, if you go to the prison, you would think that you went to a college campus. Yeah. You think you went to a place that actually is about health and healing. Yeah. So I, I want us to see the, the policing problem, not from the perspective of the officer, mm -hmm. but what we have allowed for this one person, this individual and this sector to make decisions about people. Yeah. Um, and to your last point, which is, I think, essential, they're no longer doing policing work. They are stopping unhoused people. Mm -hmm. They are going and becoming doctors and dealing with people who are dealing with mental health and other forms of health. They are, you know, going into situations that they are well unequipped. Yes. And in most cases, um, they also know that there's a certain population that they can get away right. with right. whatever right. they do. Right, right, right. And so when we talk about policing as a problem, we can also talk about the fact that the actual crime that happens in communities of color does not get resolved the way that it happens in mm -hmm. communities. Right. That's right. Right. That's right. When three young girls are killed in North Minneapolis, the urgency for the police to apprehend the individual who did that is not the same as if a white young man is killed oh, in downtown Minneapolis, within two days, you'll find somebody. Mm -hmm. So policing, I see it as a problem. It's a double jeopardy to, to us. It's, it's a double-edged sword where it doesn't work. Even right. if for it, whatever the limited intentions that were there, it doesn't work. Right. And on the other hand, it actually creates more harm. That's right, that's right. I, I just want to add to you, you made a good point. I just thought when you said they have most power in, in, in police education and the training that they get is warrior training. That's right. And so you're bringing, you're introducing warrior training to a mental health crisis or to a traffic stop. And it's known that the escalation training to a lot of officers is how you get killed. That's what they tell them. Uh -huh. So they're like, go circle the boxes, but don't do it if you want to stay, go home. Mm -hmm. So when I'm listening to you, and thank you all three of you for sharing such rich response to this question. As I'm listening, I'm, I'm, the, the word interlocking keeps coming to mind. The ways that, it, that, that what actually happens in the relational interactions or the consequences are so interlocked with all of these different systems that, that play into policing's you know, uh, unique space in the world. 
but then also this historical just rhythm of, of playing out the same way. Nakima, you noted that really not a whole lot has changed in the sense of the foundational structure itself, right? And, and actually it being immune to those kinds of changes so that there's not just a, this kind of uh, accidental white supremacist existence within policing, but there's actually an overt, there's an active piece to this. Yeah. Um, Nakeem, I wanna invite you briefly to, to help us understand, help us see a, a bit of the structural history of this. Um, one of the things you said in the interview with Oprah that I think is really important for us to, 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 to take seriously um, is the fact that what we witnessed on March 25th, 2020, the killing of George Floyd uh, was in fact a lynching. Um, to name George Floyd's death a lynching is to make clear the connections between current policing practices and the white supremacist history that continue to give them life. Um, so when you think about how the continued lynching of black men and women lives in the shadow of policing's white supremacist history. What are a few of the most problematic pieces of legislation or series of events um, that shed light on how we got here? You know, so basically, how, how, do we, how do we see what we can see right now, but see it in this historical trajectory that, that can materialize some of what often gets abstracted? Well, I think, the way that way that you framed it in the beginning when you talked about this is not just about a few bad apples right mm -hmm. this is about a rotten system but when we look at the trial of Derek Chauvin that happened recently the trial was framed as though this was one bad apple right. in a great system that's right and part of why the prosecution team articulated things in that way was because they knew that they were working with the jury that perhaps had some trust and some faith in the institution of policing and might be hesitant to convict a police officer who they witnessed on video, literally choking the life out of a, a black man who was defenseless, who was handcuffed, lying in the prone position um, for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Right. So even with that backdrop, they knew how they framed the conduct of Derek Chauvin was going to be important in terms of securing a conviction. Right. I understood why they did it from a legal perspective, but it was also problematic because for many white folks who watched that trial, who wanted to see a conviction, they feel that their work is done. Right. Yeah. And that's how we got here in the first place, right? White people who said, okay, slavery's over, our work is done, as opposed to understanding that slavery has continued to be perpetuated um, in our community time and time again, that. Black people are often relegated to the margins of society, right. limited access to resources. And even Dr. King, who I'm sure this church celebrates, said their police forces are the ultimate mockery of law. Mm, yeah. That's Dr. King. That's the Dr. King we don't hear about, That's right. who acknowledged and articulated the truth of what was happening with the institution and the system of policing. From a historical perspective, we have to understand that the history of lynching in this country is very much tied to the system of policing. Yeah. Um, often there would be circumstances in which black men in particular, but there's also evidence of uh, black women and black children being lynched as well. Yeah. But they would, um, mobs of white men would um, go into a jail or some uh, holding cell that a black person or black people who were accused of a crime were in, they would go break into the jail right. and the police would do absolutely nothing right. about it and they would allow them to engage in vigilante justice and that often included hanging someone up um, by a tree cutting off their limbs um, mutilating them and then leaving their bodies there for days and weeks at a time yeah. and so that a lynching is not just something that impacts the person as horrific as it is it actually sends a signal to the entire community that you better stay in your place. You better not interfere with white people's business, no matter what that looks like, whether it's justified or it's not, um, or this is what's going to happen to you. So That's it right. keeps a That's community right. locked in a cycle of terror, knowing that those who are supposed to uphold the law are participating um, in the terrorism being inflicted upon black people. Right. And we have to understand that we have never had a, a federal anti-lynching law right. passed in this country, despite the fact that from um, 
the 1800s to the 1900s, um, over, there have been over 4,000 documented lynchings of Black people. And that's just what we know about, right? right? And you think about the fact that um, white people would take the images from a lynching and they would send them as postcards to folks around their friends around right. the country. Kids were going, this was for show. Yeah. It was for show. You think about what happened in Duluth where um, there were black circus workers who were falsely accused of raping a white woman. And um, between one and 10,000 white men went to the jail, took three of the six black men who were accused, falsely accused of raping a white woman and they lynched them. And it was one of the, if you look at the pictures of lynchings around this country, it's one of the most horrific images um, in this nation. And I didn't realize until after I moved here that it happened right here in Duluth, right. Minnesota. Right. And so again, law enforcement has played a role um, in allowing the lynching of black bodies and participating right. in the lynching of black bodies and participating in the Klan and white supremacist groups, which the um, uh, FBI has documented. It's in writing. Yeah. So this is not yeah. something we're making up. And yet, when it comes to the conversation about policing, somehow white people tend to have collective amnesia right. regarding what has happened historically, what's going on today, um, and the role that their silence plays yeah. in allowing this history to continue to be perpetuated. And one of the things that, 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 that not only doesn't get talked about in the context of what you just shared, but actually gets talked about in a way that 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 covers it up even more is the the role that this narrative or this lie this myth of black criminality plays i mean in some ways we can't talk about lynching and not also talk about how this 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 myth was made real in successive eras mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. oh yes post slavery oh, legally yes. mm -hmm. in that sense yeah. and how there needed to become a new justification that was rooted in the same assumption of black inhumanity yeah. and not just black inhumanity but black criminality that yeah. became the justification for mm -hmm. lynching yeah. and so Dwayne, i want to invite you to 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 say something about just that cultural that racial history what has been as you think about the structural aspects of what nakima just shared um what, can you help us understand the historical connection between the racialized lies about black men, especially, but black people in general, and that structural history? Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and how have you understood this myth to have developed and, and find its way even into current policies and practices? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. That, that, uh, that's, a, that's, that's really a a, a powerful thing. I, I just listening to Nakima talking about those specific examples, but I, I, you know, this has been the project, the project of black people in in America, and we don't like to say this, but I, I think it's worth saying. Even before the nation was founded in the thirteen colonies, yeah. this is a history that I think sometimes it, it, we don't really spend a time with, but. Even before in the 13 colonies, and they all had slavery, especially in the South. I mean, South Carolina was more than 50 percent uh, enslaved black people, but they were always afraid of uprising. That's right. And, and, and insurrection. Right. Always. And 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 the key, even before, you know, with 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 the the, the crown in, in, in England, but also just among the colonies themselves, the idea was, how do we stop? these uprisings? How do we stop <laughs> these insurrections? And so what they, 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 this is where the militia comes from. Right, right. Uh, but, the, but to raise the militia and to get all of these colonies to throw in with the money, and I think the, the phrase was, we need to place a perpetual brand right. on black people as violent and inferior. Yeah a perpetual brand. That means, so the propaganda started even before the nation was founded. A and so then what you begin to see is that the rationales for enslavement, for discrimination, uh, for, for legal segregation, but even for policing now is black criminality, black inferiority, and black pathology. Right. Let's fast forward, we get to reconstruction. Yeah. 
uh, it's, it's, it's getting harder because what you start seeing is formerly enslaved are going to school. Right. They're running for office. They're becoming citizens. So now the best thing you do is you could write some laws and create the very criminals you want to point yeah. to. And then what you do, if you're, if you're a criminalized body, then you're unworthy of freedom. That's right. You're unworthy of citizenship and you're unworthy of the vote. So again, notice the perpetual brand yeah. is just been, re, it, we're just finding another way to brand. We're just right. finding, let's go, let's get up further. So now we get to 1960s and all the civil rights legislation ends legal. Before that, you know, you could do, especially in, in, in Jim Crow South, you could do whatever and you can justify it. You can use inferiority, you can use criminality, you can, can use pathology. Right. But by the time we get to the civil rights bill, legal segregation is over. Now what you've got uh, is not that you're making, you can't make us unworthy of citizenship yeah. right away. Yeah. You can't make us unworthy of freedom, uh, but then you can, you, that perpetual brand of criminality works for you. Yeah. It works now right. because now it expands to neighborhoods. Not only are, if, we, if we make you a criminal, we can make you unworthy of the vote and we can make you unworthy of your freedom. But if we expand it to the neighborhood, now you're unworthy of investment. Mm -hmm. what's, what, so what's the answer to a criminal neighborhood? What is the answer? The answer isn't investment because we don't give investments to criminals. We That's don't right. give, we don't invest in bad neighborhoods. Right. So what you're seeing today is a doubling down on the perpetual brand of criminality, violence, and inferiority. And then you, you, you get to justify not investing in communities. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I said earlier, uh, the whole discussion around policing, or I'll put the whole discussion around public safety. What do we want to do? How do we want to make people safe? Yeah. When you get to certain neighborhoods, the answer isn't public policy. It's more punitive policing. Mm -hmm. right. And the reason, it, and it's a circle. Yeah. As long as I keep showing you that you're criminal and I keep making criminal, and then here it gets even trickier. So now we come up with this broken windows policing. And I used to always say, well, why don't you just fix the windows? Why do you go hurting black people? <laughs> right. Fix, if the windows are broken, right. put in new windows. Right. Right. But instead, they've taken this policy of saying, if there is any kind of low level crime, this is why Eric Garner got killed. If there's any, we're gonna police everything. We're everything. gonna surveil everybody. We're gonna, but this again is branding the body. Right. So not only have we branded bodies, now we're branding whole neighborhoods and we justify not investing in them. We justify not, and instead you get what? You get police instead of public, good public policy for human needs, and you get prisons instead of schools. Right. Uh, this, it, it just keeps cycling itself. And so while we have, we, we, it's, it, it become de rigueur and, and, and you can't go say black people are inferior. You, you can't say that, that black people are, you know, emotionally right. unhinged. Especially or, in a post-racial right, society. Right, right, yeah, you right? can't say that. <laughs> but as long as we can rely on the criminalized body mm -hmm. and the criminal neighborhood, we can justify not investing. And then again, if you don't invest, guess what? Social and economic crisis puts people in crisis. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then you say, well, we can't invest because those people are not. So it, we find ourselves in this ongoing battle. I say that because even in the, when people talk about the night, you know, the big thing was the 1994 crime bill. And what people never talk about in that is how much, especially the Congressional Black Caucus, talked about investments in these neighborhoods. As a matter of fact, they had a phrase, a Marshall Plan for Urban America. Yeah. And it was about all of these investments. And when that bill was passed, none of that mm -hmm. was in the final bill, nothing but more punitive policing and more sentencing. Wow. So it, it comes, the perpetual brand just gets reinforced and expressed very differently, but it has the same outcome. Yeah. We are rendered right. unworthy right. of support, right. of services, of investment. Which in, which in turn continues to justify yeah. the reiterations of enslavement yes. in every era, right. despite the rhetoric and despite whatever legislative changes on the face seem yeah. like civil rights advances. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, wow. So I'm thinking about, Jelani, something that I've heard you say on a number of different occasions and in the context of talking about Islamophobia, of how fears are manufactured, right? And I'm thinking about that in the context of what Dwayne just shared about this narrative of Black criminality, right? Um, that has some unique elements to the United States in terms of the history and the way that this narrative has developed, um, but relates directly or in many respects to a lot of what you've talked about in terms of the way the media, in terms of the way politics and the way that these, these sentiments about people are actually produced socially and put into us, right? So as you think about you know, the, the communities that you represent in the context of this conversation, um, what does the problem of policing look like for persons who live at the intersection of being seen as black, um, have issues of immigration to deal with, and who are Muslim? You know, what are some of the nuances that, that we might not readily understand when trying to understand the problem of policing, particularly because we have such a large African immigrant and Muslim community here in the Twin Cities? Um, it's not good to go last. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm gonna repeat that again. No, I'm just still processing all of this uh, amazing, and I hope the people who are at home are um, in the same boat. You know, Care Minnesota was actually started because of FBI uh, wow. supervision and FBI harassment of Muslims here in Minnesota oh, wow. in 2007. And in fact, the main reason Care was began was actually because the FBI visits Muslim families every single day. At, at CARE right now, we have on a given year, maybe 100 to 125 individuals that we represent and stop the questioning by an FBI agent. We think that's less than 5% of the actual visits and they actually have seasonal. So right around spring break, it's the college students. No. Um, and in fact, there was only one black FBI agent that worked for the Minneapolis and St. Paul or Minneapolis, the, the FBI agency that I think they also manage North Dakota and South Dakota. And he became courageous. He, he was tired of following policies to decriminalize black and particularly immigrants and Muslim immigrants to the point where he leaked a document that literally said, which this happens to me, so I'll explain, that literally said that when you leave the country and come back, meaning the border, there are another officers called the border protection officers, that when you are put into secondary screening, which means you go into the second, the little, the little prison, I call it, mm -hmm. when you get there, there's an interview where they interview you before they let you back in. In that secondary screening, this document said that if you had a good interview, not a bad interview, if you had a good interview that the FBI would come to your house a week later and potentially recruit you to become an informant for them, among other things. That's literally what the document said. And immediately they criminalized him for this action. Right. Instead of being a whistleblower, he was hit with espionage charges. Yes. And I think yes. he just, just got out. So for the Muslim community, we're hit with a trifecta. You cannot leave the country right. and come back to the United States. This happened to me in February. I left, went to Somalia and got back and I landed in O'Hare and they took me to secondary screening. And I was like, mm -mm, that ain't happening. Not today. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and they said, oh, we just want to ask you a few questions. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, like, I was like, this is not happening. Right. So I come in and, um, you know, I first listened to what's going on, and there's this, about a 70-year-old Somali woman there uh, who was on the same plane that I was on. And they're asking her, like, how many festivals did she attend? And then eventually they let her go. I'm like, nope, you need to talk to bring your manager. I'm not answering a single question. And I didn't answer a single question. Mm -hmm. And then they wanted to harass me, so they were going to check your bags. I'm like, go ahead, check my bags. Then I left. And this is the type of harassment that happens to everybody. To the point today, I have Muslim, U.S.-born, doctors who when they're leaving the country call me and let me know they're leaving right mm. and when they're coming back they're worried and their family's worried that as a u.s citizen born on this soil they may be kept hours in secondary screen wow and so you have that and the border protection the fbi and with the local police the same thing the same thing you know to my community a lot of the times they actually have they have a hard time differentiating their past experience 
with policing in their own country, in particular Somalia and other places, to the policing here. And we've had cases where mothers would call on the police just to talk to their kids, and the, and the police would be like, I don't know what to do here. You haven't committed criminal activity, so I'm, I'm just gonna go. But then minutes later, their landlord sends them a letter saying they're being evicted because, because they called 911. And this happened actually in St. Paul. There's a policy that landlords can use where it's automatic, they literally start an automatic eviction through this policy that police use. And this is actually happening in all the suburbs where they literally criminalize people who are seeking help. Wow. And they kick them out because they don't want to deal with them in, in that community. So, you know, the, the Muslim community, a lot of them have internalized Islamophobia themselves. They, they've accepted this idea that the FBI, just talk to them. But you keep talking to them and nothing happens. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of doing the work that they're supposed to, preventing actual crime, they're right. knocking on your neighbor's doors every single day um, and literally wasting our resources. We have people like the guy who bombed Tennessee downtown, which people knew that he was making bombs, but the FBI didn't do anything. Right. Instead, I know what they were doing in Tennessee. They were visiting some Muslim home yeah. and harassing them. And so to what, I, to what I started, I'll end with, 99% of the individuals we represent with an FBI questioning, that is where it stops. Oh. Which means that they're, 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 they don't actually even have a reason right. to have a further conversation. Right. They and just so, know that folks don't have protection. Right, and, and sadly to say, to the larger context of the community, once this idea of terrorism mm -hmm. comes out, you lose everybody. Yes. Nobody is going to come and support you. Yeah. Right. Nobody is going to see your, your humanity. That label gets put on you, and even your own community will start walking away. Wow. Remember CVE? Yep. That was happening here, um, where I would see white people in the philanthropic community potentially being hoodwinked and bamboozled into thinking they're supporting an initiative by the U.S. Attorney's Office to help bring soccer mm -hmm. youth and youth sports programs to the Somali community, but really the surveillance program mm. um, that was happening here. Right. And we had to, you know, awaken white people who were philanthropic and charitable and thinking they're doing the right thing into understanding that you are participating in the oppression of a community that is being unfairly targeted and right. surveilled. Right. And also right. that that was Islamophobic. I mean, this idea that to your point, criminalizing a community based on the actions of few, yes. right? And so it was like, you know, I, I shared this example about CVE to actually uh, someone from the Star Tribune who was so adamant about this idea of, well, we're just helping your kids. And I said, you know, when, when Dylan Roof killed nine black people in South Carolina, the, the South Carolina community who are poor and white would not sign up to the anti-Dylan Roof right, T-ball. Right, right. They would run away. They're like, my kid is nowhere near that. Why would our kids sign up for the don't be ISIS soccer ball program? Yeah. Right. But that's a, that's how you look at a community right. when you look at them mm -hmm. through a lens that is harmful, but a racist lens that you say you're all deficient. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's help you become human to some extent. Right. right. Where where the uh, again uh, communities, you know, black people, Muslim uh, people. Uh, Somali people, people, uh, 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 our immigrant population in total, um, it becomes a way, and this is, the, again, I keep going to that word perpetual brand, not my phrase either, by the way, I think it was actually said by the legislator at the time, mm -hmm. a perpetual brand, uh, but that's the, on the, in, on the other side of that, crime that committed by white people are seen as individual crimes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is a it is a failure of that person. That's right. Uh, it has no wider implication. It does not interfere with a public policy approach to a particular neighborhood or a particular people. Uh, but other communities don't have, and that in itself, by the way, we we then train police to react. It, they get the message. They get the, the 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 plan. They know what's going on. Yeah. And 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 you, they can't, you know, they're going to leverage it for their own uh, interests. Right. Um, uh, so so all of this again, when you look at the other side, when if if people are thinking about policing, uh, again, if you, if someone in your neighbor, if in a neighborhood of white people, if someone in your neighborhood commits a crime, it has no wider implication 
on your children or your family. Right. As a matter of fact, the answer will be, how do we, typically the answer is, how do we protect and serve this mm -hmm. community? Right. Again, black communities are over policed, but right. they're not served and they're not protected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that there's a difference yeah. over policed and, and surveilled and harassed, but never protected, never served. Well, and the media plays a role. Oh, yeah. yes. As well, because they're humanized <laughs> when uh, yeah. white people, even when they commit mass shootings, yeah. they're yes. humanized. You never hear the terminology white on white crime, um, but you always hear that refer to what happens in an under-resourced community yes. when people kill each other or they resolve conflict in a way that is deadly, it is pathologized as black on black crime. That's right. You know, going back to what you were saying earlier and the media mm -hmm. plays a role in that. And, you know, here we've had issues with the, the Star Tribune, yeah. right? Which I can guess that the majority of people here probably read articles from the Star Tribune or subscribe to the paper. And, um, they have had a history of demonizing those who have been killed by police or criminalized by police, even those who um, have been incarcerated for crimes that they didn't no, commit, commit, like Mayan Burrell, for right. example. And um, it's not called out. Yeah. And we're often fighting the battle of challenging police violence, trying to challenge the media, and trying to challenge mainstream um, white Minnesotans' perception of what is going on. Right. It, it is, it's, it's very, very difficult. And right. even within our own community, trying to help keep people's spirits up and, and focused on something brighter, um, people internalize what is happening and it causes a lot of despair right. and additional trauma in our community. Yeah, it's, it's hard as hell to be human yes. underneath all of this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and not the least of the fact that, that when you speak up, you're speaking up from a place of, of, a, of a Black positionality and a Black embodiment. So it, it can get put into a category oh, yes. that doesn't register. Right. right? right. So I'm thinking about not only the, the structural realities that you all have, have helped us see, but also those that that kind of socially productive pe the, the media, the way that this can create perceptions in people who are none the wiser. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about those two together and I'm wanting to, this is a question for the panel because we're, we're coming close on, on the time. So I wanna get to this. What are some of the biggest challenges that we need to consider um, as we are talking about potential reform or, 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 or more radical changes, I mean, as these possibilities are coming up, both around the country, but in the Twin Cities, what are some of the biggest challenges that you all see um, to making real change that actually represents the needs of the community? Because we've seen historically mm. the way that, that when, when, when changes happen, right. there's either often a backlash or on the face, those changes really have some loopholes written into them. So what are some of the challenges that you all see that, that people in the community that want to get involved and that may be aware of the fact that their own perception is skewed and might want to learn differently, what do they need to know about the biggest challenges to policing? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll start with this because I think my frustration uh, with it is a sense that um, there, there, there's a, there's a, a real, there's a real risk in thinking that because you're now conscious or aware that that's the work. Right. Uh, there's also the risk that, um, that I think we have to be mindful. And by the way, this is personal too, because there are things that I care about. And then the question then becomes, how do I make it salient? It's not, going it's to, not going to be salient because you just decide it's a good thing to think about. Right. Sometimes you've got to make it so. Right. Uh, and, and the one thing on this issue is, you know, actually I think it, it could be very easy to get into a discussion around policing. Right. Because it's academic and it's theoretical. Right. right. And the question I want people to ask is, so how do I get this out of that, 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 that pool of academic or theoretical? Yeah. What am I willing to put on the line? And that's the key, put on the line. I often, one of the things that I often think about 
when I think about putting on the line, I think about what happened after John Lewis and those people were hit on Edmund, Edmund Pettus Bridge. Yeah. And, and what happened, and then you, you get a call out for people to come and, and to come to, to Montgomery. And, and they come and they were told, you are putting it on the line. Right. And James Reeb, a white Unitarian minister comes and he knows it's dangerous and he gets killed. Now, I'm not asking you to, to I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but what I'm saying is, it's actually safer. Right. It is safer to make reform a salient issue for yourself. As someone who was in politics for a very long time and was on the receiving end of a lot of campaigns, for, especially from the evangelical right, yeah. I'm telling you what happens when someone makes, say, an issue like abortion their only issue. It doesn't matter any other issue. Than the, and, 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 and I'm not getting into the, the, the substance of why they make that issue, but the point is the reason they have some victories and they can be effective is because they've made that their salient issue. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if you know deep down that this that there has to be something policing has to change this has to be the issue that you lead with in your circle of influence in your power it has to be it right. and the second thing i would say is again all of those discussions around and i, I can't get away from it investments in human needs in, in investments in communities of color in these communities you, you, those are not academic discussion. Right. And if you allow yourself, and, and, and trust me, I know how it's done. Don't allow yourself to fall into that category of this is a zero sum That's or right. that someone has to be worthy. That's right. Because the worthiness question has already been, been built in. Yeah. These neighborhoods are criminal. Those black people are criminals and automatically unworthy. That's right. And so you cannot fall for that. Yeah. You have to make sure that you don't fall. That so when we have this discussion about healthcare, a living wage, if you find yourself going to trying to figure out if someone's worthy of it, you've already been co-opted. That's good. That's good. You've already been co-opted. Yeah. Thank and you. and I, that's the kind of thing I want people to make these things salient in your life. Right. Uh, so that if you want to see the kind of change we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. We'll pick up on that. Even when people are having these academic discussions, they're still using a white revisionist framework mm -hmm. to articulate what happened. Mm -hmm. So during the um, uprisings that happened in Brooklyn Center, we had a press conference and we were basically standing black and white women in solidarity, um, talking about what needed to change and this officer needed to be charged and things like that. And there was a there was a reporter there who asked me about looting, mm -hmm. and I, I challenged him. I reframed the discussion to say, "Listen, white people are the original looters." Mm -hmm. And for people listening, they might, you know, but yep. it's like understand yep. what's happened historically. Right. Land right. has been looted from <laughs> our Native American brothers and sisters. Our labor, our quality of life, our ability to be free. Not to mention actual property and everything else that has been looted. Um, and continues to be looted, which leads to a lot of the problems that we see in our communities that are under-resourced right. and ignored right. um, and seen as being unworthy. And so if white people are even going to have this discussion, it's important to be brutally honest yeah. by looking at what has happened historically and then reframing the discussion from what you have been taught. Right. Because yeah. most of the time, what you have been taught is false. It's right. painted white people as heroes, black people as criminals, even though the original criminals were the ones that brutalized Native American people and, and children and tried to whitewash them and did all kinds of things in those communities, not to mention the brutalization and dehumanization of black bodies, the rape of black bodies, yeah. the forced impregnation of black women, um, the lynchings that have happened, Th that's criminality. Right right? That it gets ignored. It gets whitewashed when the mobs have come into black communities, when they've surrounded black homes, terrorized people, shot at people, gotten away with it. Mm -hmm. Where was child protection? 
when white people had their children at lynchings watching black bodies hang and burn. Yeah. Where was child protection? But now suddenly when it comes to black families and native families who are under resourced, you have to bring in a system as the Calvary and doing more harm to these communities. So if white people are gonna have a discussion, be honest about the role that your ancestors have played and the role that you have played in perpetuating white supremacy and in giving, giving credence to systems that have dismantled black families and communities and continue to perpetuate harm. Yes. That to me is the first step. Yeah. And once you're willing to be honest about the narrative, then it's putting some skin in the game. That's right. And not just processing as we see happening in Minnesota, but actually being willing to put something in the game, put something on the line, be willing to challenge the status quo and the system and your own circle and your own family That's right. um, in order to advocate for what is truly right and just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and even in the one-to-one -one over the dinner table conversations, it matters. Yes. As I'm thinking about what you just shared, it matters in every instance because it's the, it's the accumulation of those moments that, that do not get disrupted right. toward those ends that allows these things to continue to go unchecked, yeah. that allows people's perceptions to continue to be rooted in myths that were made real. Yeah. Mm -hmm and socially produced, and then institutions are built around them. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right, that's right. Delani. Um, I will just say, I'm not going last again. I'm just kidding. No, um, <laughs> no but I, 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 it, it, I think all of you hit it on the nail. And I, I just wanna, you know, I've been in Minnesota since 1993. Minnesotans are passive aggressive. They are people who do not like conflict. Right are just hoping that some Monday morning they're gonna wake up and George Floyd think it's just gonna be over right. and we're just gonna move right. on and right. we're gonna talk about the snow and we're gonna talk about, and I just feel like people need to really wake up because too many people say, oh, you know, and I see it during the MLK week and day, passionate about justice, yeah. passionate about these things yeah. we need. And at the end of the day, they don't do anything, right. and and right. and and to be honest with you, if you say you would have walked, you would have marched with Dr. King back then. You're not marching now, so you wouldn't <laughs> march then either. Absolutely, and right? most folk didn't. And <laughs> and and the reality is, right. Dr. King wasn't so heroic. That's right. Or he popular. was, yeah, he was seen as a militant. He was seen as the yes. guy that should just sit down, yes. go somewhere, <laughs> stop you know, doing what you're doing, which people tell us all the time, like, right. stop, you know, things will just happen. And I, I just feel like, you know, I personally feel like God chose us in this moment. I feel like Minnesota, George Floyd, this moment was chosen for this community. And yeah. maybe there's something good in us, something yeah. amazing in yeah. us. And, and it has to come out of us. That's good. And as both of you just said, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And and let black people lead. Yeah. Because there's a lot of learning that happens in that in that journey. Yeah. But in but what we need is your body, your yes. mind, and your ability to use your resources yes. to make an impact. Yes. And right now, the governor of the state of Minnesota, the House and the Senate are playing. Yeah knowing that they could pass meaningful legislation yep. and start the process, but they won't. They won't. Because this is what they have done historically. Yes. And I told somebody this, I said, what's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat? The Republican will put a, a closed sign in front of a store mm -hmm. and, a Rep and a Democrat will say, opening soon. <laughs> and none of them will open the door. Right, just like that. So I feel like we need Minnesotans, good Minnesotans. And by, by the way, since I'm standing and sitting in a church, it is the faith people. Yes. It's historically been the faith people. And it's time for us to get out of the sanctuary and actually be out on the streets with people like Dr. King and others who made it their priority yeah. to even risk the life of children mm -hmm. for justice. And they did not go home that's right. Worried about the next day. They went to that fight knowing that something bad could happen. Yes. So I, I, I'm calling on the Minnesotans. You all know what to do. Yeah. The question is, are you going to go back up north again this summer and go up there for your vacation up north? Or are you going to stand up and do something? Yeah. Are you going to 
plan your foot and say, enough is enough, we're going to do something about yeah. it. Thank and you. we may not have all the answers, as we said. Correct. We don't right. have monopoly on good ideas. Right. But the question is, are you willing to stand with us in this moment? Right. Or are you going to be one of those people that claim credit when things get done? <laughs> and your great-grandchildren are going to ask you, yes. what did you do? And you're saying, oh, I was there. Yeah. So we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. But before we do that, from each of you, I just, this is inspiring. And it's, and it's also curious to me why we could have a clearer picture of what we're up against and still have the hope and the motivation to continue, right? So real quick, what is the conviction, the moral conviction, the theology, whatever it is for you, what is it that keeps you pressing this issue despite the, the evidence, historical and contemporary? I, uh, I have to go back to, and I have to say it explicitly, Jesus of the gospel. Okay. <laughs> the Jesus of the gospels uh, not only put forth an alternative ordering of things, he embodied it. it, it, it and it didn't matter uh, how dangerous it was. Right. It didn't matter if it was confusing. And it was confusing to a lot of people, even mm -hmm. the people who went with him, they didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the one thing that I keep saying in my ministry is that uh, the world already is, 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 has everything it needs to tell you that this is the way it should be and has to be. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, a lot of us are sitting around here knowing that that isn't the way it is or right. should be or ought to be. Uh, and the one thing that I, I keep looking to the Jesus of the Gospels is because uh, if, if he were doing an assessment of how effective he was at the mm -hmm. time, and by the way, uh, Rome won mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in that, in that, right. fight, in that right. fight originally. Right. Um, the issue wasn't about whether or not I lived to see it. Right. The issue was I'm going to press it That's right. because it's right. That's right. And so I, what keeps me going is that I get to say, and I get to talk about an alternative, I get to imagine it. That's good. And you could take a lot away from me, but you cannot take my imagination. Mm. And you cannot take the spirit, the spirit inspiring me with that imagination to mm. say, this is the alternative. So it keeps me going. I get to say it. I get to, I get to be noisy. I get to be, you know, I get to, you know, be prophetic and yeah. that, you know that's not fun all the time that's right um but it but here's why i do it too because martin luther king's imagination made me possible mm. a kid from jim crow mississippi uh it made it possible that's right uh, my father didn't see it uh uh, but but they knew it was possible. And so that's the same imagination that's that good. I bring to this work. And that's it keeps good. me going. That's good. Thank you. Just to piggyback off of that, my faith is what keeps me going. And it was like you were saying, Jesus of the gospel. It was like meeting Jesus of the streets, mm -hmm. right? The one that flipped over the table, the yeah. one that just spoke the truth unapologetically and boldly and upended the social order. Yeah. Um, when he spoke that truth and seeing that he was talked about he was demonized. Um, he was treated as if he were the problem, yeah, right. even though he was speaking the <laughs> truth. Right. Right. And then ultimately we saw that the criminal justice system took his life That's as well, right. Yep. right? In collaboration with religious leaders. So right. just even to piggyback off of what Jelani said about, it's always been the church. I think it's been the salt, a small percentage of the church yeah. that has stood up. Cause even when you look at what happened during Dr. King's day, you had um, the eight white leaders who wrote a letter to Dr. Mm -hmm. King saying, you're stirring up the town's Negroes, you need to sit down somewhere. And then he responded eloquently with his 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. But in the letter from the eight white clergymen, they said, even the black pastors agree with us. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. right? right. So that's important to understand that's right. that the religious order did not support Dr. King, even right. though we know that God empowered and inspired him. So looking at that history and understanding that is what helps me keep going in spite of the oppression, the attacks, the people who try to silence me and others and undermine our work, God already laid out the blueprint. 
right? That this is a part of the process. And if they talked about Jesus, they're going to talk about those who stand for Jesus. That's good. So I have to continue to depend on God in order to move forward in the spirit of Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, and everybody who came before us who faced even more dire yeah. circumstances right. than what we face in the 21st century. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, for me also, faith is very important. And, um, you know, the last sermon that Prophet Muhammad gave was a, a sermon about um, coexistence, a sermon about race, racism, um, as if he portrayed it as this was going to be the challenge. Mm -hmm. We leave you with the last words. And uh, I talked about superiority yeah. of, of all races over each other. Uh, but I, I draw back um, another story that I think brings us all home, especially all of our three Abrahamic faith, the story of Moses. And, you know, think about, I mean, this is, this is the, this has always been the struggle that there's always going to be tyrants who are pharaohs. Um, and God didn't ask him to weep it away, no. pray it away, you know, email it away. Like, <laughs> no, you're going to <laughs> where right. the fire is That's right. That's right. and you're not going to be telling him you're going to do it in a nice way, but you're not going to tell him sugarcoat it. Yeah. Tell him exactly what it is. Yeah. And then go to the ocean <laughs> and wait there because there's the ocean. <laughs> I mean, I want you to know, like, like this is not in these moments. We are the generation. Right. Yes. Like this is our moment. Right. There's no other somebody else coming. Right. <laughs> this is this is Yo, us right. in this moment. Right. And all of the people who exist today who saw George Floyd being killed. This is us. Yeah. And, there, and, in, in, and in the story of Moses, just like in, in every time, there are people who go along, people who are courageous, people who are on the front lines, and there are many people who can't. Mm -hmm. So you have to choose. Yep. In this moment, wh where do you belong? Which camp do you belong? Yeah. Those who went against Moses or those who courageously went with Moses? Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. And if we don't, who will? That's right. Thank you. Thank you all. So we have some questions, I'm sure. Um, and we have we have 18 minutes. Uh, is that, did I do my math right? Yes. Yeah. 18 oh, wow. minutes. So how did we do that? <laughs> he kept us on yeah. task as the moderator. Well done, Gary. All right. So yes, we do have some questions that have come in. And some of them are very specific. And I know that we have uh, some subsequent con conversations in the fall where these will be talked about with more robustness. So yeah. I'm naming that now that these are very specific questions. In fact, one is for you, Nakima. I it, know you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you can read my eyes. All right. So, and Nakima, should the Minneapolis Police Department be defunded? Why or why not? Well, I would say absolutely um, in the sense of the fact that we had spent over $193 million a year up until the last year to maintain a police force that has been known for brutality mm -hmm. um, against African Americans and other people of color that had killed a long line of people and gotten away with it, and that has continued to criminalize folks who are um, already being neglected by society. Right. Um, so I, I think that we have spent far too much um, on our system of policing in Minneapolis and there hasn't been adequate accountability in terms of seeing, one, looking at the structure of our police department. Um, we had a group called uh, Minneapolis for a better policing contract that were average citizens who reviewed the police federation contract and they they looked at the structure and part of what they found was that more than a quarter of Minneapolis officers are sergeants but no one knows like really why they need to be sergeants and what they're actually doing that's expensive mm -hmm. right we're not auditing how the police are using their time and we know that there's been a huge slowdown of police responses to 911 calls not just since the uprising after George Floyd but since Jamar Clark was killed in 2015. Mm -hmm. And no one has come to the public and explained mm -hmm. why we have this slowdown when we were fully staffed, yeah. why there was a low clearance rate for homicides, rapes, and everything else when we were fully staffed, 
and why we need to continue this massive investment in our current system of policing. So yes, I do believe that we need to defund. And I, I, I hesitate typically to use that language because most people think something else when they hear defund. Yeah. But what mm -hmm. I'm saying is decreasing our reliance on the Minneapolis police and the resources we put into it and having a more robust focus on the needs of our community from an economic perspective, mental health and everything, housing and everything else that people need. Thank you, Nikima. We'll get to another uh, specific one in a moment, but here is uh, one that's a little more general. How do we have discussions about policing in our rural communities when many want to say that it's a big city issue? It's not. The percentage of arrests and incarceration of Black and Indigenous individuals in our communities show the white supremacy of policing in our communities too. That's in parentheses. Bad apples is what many want to believe because in small rural communities, they are our Sunday school teachers and t-ball coaches. We talk a lot about Minneapolis specifically. Yeah. But this is, and but it's being handled by the Minnesota's legislature in certain mm -hmm. ways. Right. And what we do here reverberates. I, I, I'll, I'll respond to it. So I'm, actually, I'm going to even make it more complicated. <laughs> we, we, the way we do policing in this country is technically we keep saying police, but there are over 18,000 police departments mm -hmm. and they all have their own uh, way of doing things. But I, but I, I want to get back to this, this discussion of oversight and accountability. Every institution subjects itself to some site, some kind of oversight and accountability. And the ones that don't become corrupt and unmanageable. Uh, I, if, as I survey institutions, every institution, I, 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 again, I'm thinking uh, CIA, bad, bad behavior, uh, but some real substantive reforms in, that have, after 9-11, FBI, CIA, some real substantive changes to how they do the work. And they have to get, they get hauled up to, to Congress <laughs> to answer questions all the time. Their money and their funding, all of that is implicated. So I bring that up for even the small town police department, because I think every citizen, just as you want oversight of your, your council or anything like that, you must subject police to that same. And given the, what Jelani said early on, uh, given the power that they have with the, the sanctioned privilege and power to use state violence, they need to be accountable. So whatever is going on in your community, your community has something, small, large, your police have to be made accountable to your communities. And there is something uh, you should go and ask questions and get your council and your mayors, whatever form of government you have, to make sure that some uh, an institution that has been given the power, the sole power of to use state violence to be accountable to civilian oversight and control. And that, that's what I would say. And it, so it, all, it doesn't matter what your issues are. It doesn't matter whatever your small town issues are. You need to be there and ask your elected officials and your lawmakers and your voters to hold those institutions accountable. I'll just add by saying, if there are black people in that small town, if there are Latinos in that small town, mm -hmm. if there are immigrants in that small town, Minnesota is 80 I don't know, nine 84 or eighty-four percent white, but predominantly most of the it's it's even more white in rural Minnesota. Um, and I also think there is a perception by white working class that white poor mm -hmm. Americans somehow are also immune from right. being killed. Oh. They are killed in they are poor neighborhoods. They are often the ones that are being over surveilled. Mm -hmm. um, and in rural America, it's also Native Americans who are also killed. Um, and I also think it's actually more corrupt. The smaller the system, the more that discretion is, well, I know Bill and he's drunk, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to charge him. I'm just going to take him home. 
but God forbid Muhammad was driving through. Yes. They will they will stop him in the middle of the road for no reason and just let him know that this is the kind of town where that we check on people. Yeah. So I I I I push back that hard because I think somehow there is always this rural urban divide. Yeah. That creates this perception somehow in the rural America it's much better. It's not. It's actually worse for people of color. It's always been worse for minorities in, 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 in rural America, even though today in the state of Minnesota, rural Minnesota is heavily reliant on Latino and immigrant labor. And if those individuals leave, those businesses will leave and those small towns will turn into dust bowls. Well, and also the rural communities that are relying upon the prisons mm -hmm. coming into their town. Mm -hmm. They've gone to the legislature and they've lobbied and advocated for prisons to come into their town to create jobs when they have these dying industries. Mm -hmm. And that helps to pit rural white people against black people who live in urban cities. But I think a lot of this has to do with our unreconciled racial history in America. Um, we're oftentimes we're talking about these issues in a compartmentalized way. Why aren't we talking about reparations? Mm. Why aren't we talking about correcting historical inequities? And even recently, we saw the passage of Juneteenth, you know, as a federal holiday, that bill being signed into law. And initially, I was excited that finally we got some traction. My husband said, well, why are they quick to sign Juneteenth into law, but they won't sign the George Floyd Police. Policing <laughs> Act into law, the Emmett Till anti- that's lynching right. law, That's right. um, the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, <laughs> it's law, yeah. right? It's a superficial change that's happened that will also give white people an opportunity to have a paid holiday, right? So there, where's the accountability um, and where are the resources that we've been asking for for many, many decades? Yes. This cycle will continue until we address the economic issues that flow out of white supremacy and that continue to hinder our community and subject us to um, far too many police officers coming in, able to have authority over black bodies who don't even live there. 92% yeah. of Minneapolis cops don't even live in Minneapolis. Why are we okay with that? Why are Minneapolis residents okay with that? That's a problem. We're paying their salaries. We're paying their benefits. We're paying their pensions to get extremely poor service in return. And a lack of feeling of safety in the black community. That's a problem. So with eight minutes left, about six of these questions <laughs> can be lumped into one. Okay. Should we just, should we go for that one? Sure. All That's right. Cool. I'll try to sum it up, but I'm going to use pieces of it. And I think you can, you can predict it. It is future looking. It is asking for solutions. It is seeking creative uh, answer. So simply put, somebody said, what are solutions for the future? Somebody else said, protect and serve. What is your vision for a public safety agency whose role is to protect and serve? Can you give any successful examples of creative and new approaches to this? This is the overwhelming in the questions. This mm. is what's coming up. I will start. Yeah, I'll start. Yeah. That tough question. I'm just kidding. No, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just bringing some humor. I'm bringing humor because it's one way to that's right. deal with all of this. But I, I, I think that's a fair question. It's yeah. a question about how do we move forward? Um, and, you know, right now we have in the state of Minnesota, eight bills, nine bills, actually, and a few more mm -hmm. that could get us into fundamentally moving us forward. And these are basic concepts of, well, if there's a, someone who has mental illness, should someone who is trained to deal with mental illness be there? No brainer, but apparently the police don't want that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, should families who have had their loved one kill be able to sue the government and have their case be heard in court? Well, absolutely, but apparently that's not good. Um, how about we make sure police officers are you know, if they're part of a white supremacy group that they lose their life. I mean, these are, they seem to be a base level start, right. but we are not even able to pass those legislations in the state of Minnesota. So when we talk about futuristic, hopeful, 
reimagining public safety, having those longer discussions, because this is gonna take us a while. And I think people need to accept that. We, we, but we need wins now, and we need the ending of an ongoing um, system, which I think we discussed a little bit about, which the media play into a role, which I would also say for the longest period of time, we have to accept that we have also been indoctrinated so much and so, so long to accept the police to be good. Mm -hmm. Well, good police wants accountability. Yeah. Why can't we have that conversation? And unfortunately, I would say to many people who are seeking those, there are many solutions that have been considered, many solutions that have been uh, proposed. The reason why we haven't enacted on them is because sadly, but a reality, George Floyd had to die for people to even think yeah. we had a problem. And, and, and Jelani, all those bills, he, he said the reason they haven't been passed is because lawmakers know that there is no price to pay to ignore the demands for it. They know. They know there is no price to pay to not offering fundamental, I, again, I, at the anniversary of George Floyd's death, uh, uh, in one of the many services that I went to, someone asked you know, uh, uh, about where are we? And, 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 and my whole point was, given what happened in this last year, you would have thought, that the easiest thing would have been to, to, to do is to do some kind of police reform bill. They're not even giving us the, they're not even dangling in a, a symbolism in our face. At least with June 10th, we get <laughs> symbolism. <laughs> Minnesota doesn't even give us symbolism. So, so again, and the reason they don't have to, and it goes back to what we were saying about skin in the game and doing, it's because there's no price to pay. This is what I mean about leveraging racist backlash. The police know how to do it. And our lawmakers know that they don't, they don't have to address it. And so the reason those things haven't, been, and this is where, again, you play a role. How do you make this salient? How you, does your lawmaker, your lawmaker, do they know that this is your voting issue? I would say um, here in Minnesota, it's important for white people who consider themselves to be progressive to not pat yourselves on the back and think that you're okay when it comes to race, racism, white supremacy in these conversations. When I ran for mayor in 2017 on a police accountability platform, yeah. some of the greatest amount of backlash and racism that I dealt with was from white progressives. Um, and who, many of whom didn't want to see an outspoken Black woman speaking to these issues and calling it out. And they wanted to say, oh, it's just the Republicans. I'm like, no, it's the Republicans and the Democrats that are playing a role in what is happening to our community. We cannot talk about um, addressing public safety without economic justice. Right. Dr. King talked about that time and time again and said, look, we're tired of going to the bank with a check marked insufficient funds. Mm. That is still the issue today um, that permeates our most under-resourced communities, right? You have people who cannot get a job that pays a living wage, which impacts their ability to have stable and affordable housing or buy a home. Um, we have, what, a 20-something percent home ownership rate for Black people in Minnesota, and a 70 something to 80% home ownership rate for white people in Minnesota, not to mention the net, the gaps in net worth between black Minnesotans and white Minnesotans. And so when people don't have access to resources, they go into survival mode. That leads to all kinds of things that make a community feel unsafe um, and that keep this cycle going with police and criminal justice and dismantling families and communities. So the two go hand in hand. You can't talk about public safety and not talk about economic justice. No, I can't do and it. And corporations have to stop just paying lip service to the issue. If you can't even promote Black people within your corporations, how are you going to help create jobs in our most under-resourced communities and bring everyone up to a decent quality of life? It, it's not happening because it's not being taken seriously um, because the people who have the power to change things are not being directly impacted. Right. And that is huge. It needs to change. It needs to change today. 
Um, so I want to see us get more serious about these issues. And again, as we said before, put some skin in the game. Mm. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not serious. That's just the bottom line. With all due respect to those who are listening, who are part of this in good faith, if you are not uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable, I question whether you have any real skin in the game in terms of addressing issues. We are at 8.30. <laughs> and uh, there's, good, there's some good questions still left <laughs> un, un, unanswered. And, and it's so hard for me to, to say... No you know, <laughs> that I'm done asking you the questions. It, but these are good fodder for next conversations and specifically one on what is the role of faith communities? Yeah. I mean, we are sitting in a church. Everybody here has, everybody who's speaking is, has a role in this in one way or another as in a faith community. And I'll, you're going to, you're going to real quickly. For 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 this Plymouth Church and for for clergy, if you are listening to me, um, the only thing I would say is just please, please, please understand that our role is not to be a chaplain for any empire. Our role is not to make the government comfortable. Our, you know, I often say over and over again the government should be afraid of us and not because of, of you know, not because of, of some, you know, some parochial theological sexual issue or anything. No, because we should be led with a, the, 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 the mission to do justice, yeah. to do justice. The government's job, they know the language of justice. That's not what the government does. The government's ju it, 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 justice is not its mission. Uh, they made, it, I, I've been governed a long time. Our mission is not justice, uh, but the church's is. And so I, whatever you think you, whatever you're wondering about, just understand something that uh, the, 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 the human needs that are, so we see them all around us. Uh, the human needs that we see all around us, the injustice we saw all around us, we are sometimes the only institution that has the, the authority and the power to speak to it. And when we, when we, when we do not use that power, uh, we are, we are, are co-opted and we are ineffective. Absolutely. And leveraged against yes. the Black community, other communities of color, and poor people. And it's unfortunate when we see it. And I would say, if people really want to know what's going on, talk to people who have been inside of the system and who've come out, who can tell you what happened that led for them to be in the system and what they need in order to have, live a life outside um, of the criminal justice system. There's a lot of people like that who are being neglected and ignored, um, who could use our support, our voices, and everything else that comes with that, if we're willing to put the work in. Yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, I think it's a test from God. So if, if, if you think you're a person of faith and you show up Sunday or Friday or Saturday or any other faith, then prove it. Prove it. And, and you can't run away from this thing. It's in front of your door. Yes. We're Minnesotans. George Floyd was killed on our watch in our own city with our own taxpayer dollars, yes. with our own complacence. If you feel guilty about what happened, it's time for you to do something about it. And so in faith, we, we say we're good people. Yeah. We say we're trying to be good people. We say we, we, we are trying to follow the steps of the, the teachings of God, and we want to be good with God. Well, God wants you to stand up against the pharaohs and the tyrants and wants you to do something about it. Absolutely. And if you really believe, then you understand that God has your back. So why, who are you, what are you afraid of? Right. What, what are you afraid of? And so um, I, I have that, you know, people always tell me, and I'm even not now, but even before, like, oh, you're going against the government and, you know, things may bad happen to you. And they would talk to my dad and try to convince him and, you know, <laughs> to try to like calm me down. And, <laughs> and I'm like, listen, as long as I'm standing for justice and as long yes. as I'm doing the right thing, and as long as I'm in connection and in, with God, then God has my back. Yep. And there are a lot of David and Goliath fight every single day. 
Absolutely. And and some of you, you think that that fight is big. It's actually just on your cul de sac. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that's right. that's, that's you might put a right. Black Lives Matter sign and you think that's enough, which is not enough. But if you think even that alone, people will fight over you. People mm -hmm. will yeah. come after you. You know, I, I, some of us, I, I, I can't go to Menards these days because <laughs> somebody will be like, well, you know, you, you wanted this. Look at the city. You know, look at this. You know, and, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, bring it on. Right. <laughs> bring the it on. The backlash and the demonization that bring we face on. just for standing up and fighting. But I'll leave people with this. And when we're thinking about George Floyd, realize he was our neighbor. Yeah. Dante Wright was our neighbor. Winston Smith was our neighbor. Jamar Clark was our neighbor. Philando Castile was our neighbor. How neighborly were we mm, in return? Right. And you're always contributing to something. This, this assumption that, that there can be a neutrality. Oh, yes. That, that your moral responsibility doesn't have to touch everything because I'm just minding my business. And so one of the things that keeps pressing on me, it goes back to imagination. The moral responsibility that we have to moral imagination, because the possibilities, the, the, the fact that there are possibilities for change fuel the reason why it's not good enough for me not to disrupt in this moment, That's or it's right. not good enough for me that when I hear this story that I need to tell a counter story yeah. because it doesn't seem that big of a deal mm -hmm. in this moment. And understanding that stories are always getting told oh, yes. in one direction or the other, and that they're always productive of some reality, yeah. even when you think that this is just a dinner table conversation. That's right. That's right. So what I would say to people um, is that when is, is to learn the story through a critical lens and and be willing to tell a counter story. Yes. One that 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 to to something you said, uh, Dwayne, if your if your gospel doesn't liberate. That's right. It's not gospel. It's mm -hmm. not gospel. It's not good news. <laughs> it comes down to that single question. Which direction is this moving in relation to the reality as it is? That'll tell you a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like a good ending question to leave <laughs> to leave the to leave Aren't the audience amazing? with. Oh, I tell you, thank you, amazing people. Wow, we had just shy of two hundred people, two hundred screens, so more than that people. Oh, good. And in future, we hope to do it in person. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, I didn't plan any closing <laughs> remarks, but uh, <laughs> all I have to say is thank you to to thank the you. three of you for being willing to to offer your voices, to offer your perspectives. Um, to be in conversation with me in this moment. And I hope that this won't be the last because it will need to be an ongoing collaborative effort yes. if we're going to get to where we know we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you.